Welcome back to the Wolf Den Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Nako, joined by Zenitsu, and today we're going to discuss the uh, complete Digifest meta. Uh, all of the Digifests have concluded in the various regions, and we now have the full breadth of information from which to discuss and really make analyses on uh, the BT7 meta as it exists with side decks and mulligans. Um, so we might as well start with just a breakdown of what we have. Uh, Zenitsu has done me the favor of compiling this information, so I will begin by discussing it. Uh, so, uh, it's no surprise that Blue Hybrid is the strongest, or at least most, uh, plentiful deck in the format. Um... Based on the topping results we have here, uh, Blue Hybrid being 64, almost 65% of the top 16s, uh, Yellow Hybrid coming in second with 8%, Red Hybrid tied with 8%. So, like, these, you know, um, percentages are going to be comparison. So, 31 out of 48 decks were Blue Hybrid. <laughs> Four were yellow, four were red, three were Lilith Loop, two were Cherubi, and then we had a couple one of one Jessmon, one Rookie Rush, one Lord Nightmon, one Three Musketeer. Okay, I really didn't like talking for that long right off the bat, but I'm the one that has it written down. What are your thoughts, Zenitsu? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so just as a quick disclaimer, there's obviously more Digifests, uh, but we weren't able to get the top 16s to, like, accurately put together in a nice formalized list to get this, so we just got the top 16s that we could from some of the larger, more noticeable ones. Uh, but with that disclaimer out of the way, as far as the data that we're looking at, um, yeah, Blue Hybrids is looking to be a little bit extra dominating, um, and I think part of it is just how we're playing and where our perception currently is. So I'm not trying to say Blue Hybrids is not a strong deck because it obviously is if it's doing this well, but it has to be doing this well for a particular reason beyond it being just this good. Mm -hmm. So uh, something I didn't mention, I really didn't want to talk for that long right off the bat. I wanted to give Zenitsu a chance to speak, but uh, between these events, we don't have all of their data captured uh, within the uh, numbers I just gave you because, uh, as Zenitsu mentioned, we don't have as many. We only wanted to include tournaments that we had a full top 16 for, so we discluded any we only had like winners or just top fours and stuff like that. But uh, not every... So of the five events that we were tracking, uh, the Arlington, Texas, Digifest, Blue Hybrids 1, the Miami... Digifest PPG, uh, Blue Hybrids won. But the London Digifest Green Hybrids won. The Cardiff Digifest Jessmon won. And the Oceanic Digifest Yellow Hybrids won. So out of the five events, um, only Blue Hybrid only won two of them, which I think is somewhat telling, especially the low sample size of those decks throughout. Uh, like, I mean... So we're not, we weren't we couldn't find a full top 16 for the uh, London Digifest, so we didn't include it in our aggregate data, and there aren't any in our tops for the tournaments in which we've captured. So the fact that it won a tournament, I think, is fairly surprising. Right, and like this kind of just goes to show. Like, also the thing to note is uh, both of the North American Digifests were. Um, won by uh blue hybrids so like it might just be a more of a north american thing rather than a more global thing but the fact that like other decks can do well and top still is very telling that the format isn't necessarily as solved as we think it is and there's still just lots of room to grow learn and you know adapt to the current environment that we're given in considering we've been in this type of a situation before where it was bt4 we just were hot off the heels of a ban that just put green in its place. And by in its place, I mean almost non-existent. The bin. The bin. <laughs> yeah. And um, that kind of made War Greymon, Yellow War Greymon, shine a little bit extra bright. 
uh, in comparison. And I think like we're seeing some very similar results here where it's just like, okay, yellow hybrids was put in its place uh, because it got the most direct nerfs, but, um, and that's kind of making blue hybrid shine, even though it did get a nerf, just the way it plays is still very, very strong. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of uh, player play style also. A lot of people just really like what blue does. I think, um, like I guess with with any with any data set, there are different lenses you have to understand. Like, you know, what is our bias coming to this? Like, as based on which tournaments we've chosen. Since you just pointed out, there is more North American data represented here than other regions. So, you know, that's potentially just a North American bias. There's also the bias as like, um, what we which decks we decide to include in our data set. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, data scientist, you know, <laughs> bullshit you could get into. But, um, so, the idea that blue is the best deck is something that I know has been discussed. And I think we're mostly just seeing, like, averages here. Like... Not, that blue is is a, is an above average deck, decidedly top two if not top one, you know, and it, as a result of that, a lot of people are bringing it, and as a result of that, a lot of people are winning with it. So it doesn't mean that if we like brought everyone in the room and forced, you know, two people to play each various deck, that blue would still win every time. Like we don't necessarily know that, but we just know that a lot of people are playing it, and a lot of people are winning with it. Right, and it kind of feeds into the uh, self-fulfilling prophecy that I kind of discussed previously, where it's just like part of the meta is uh, not only just the power of a deck, but the um, play prevalence of the deck. And if everyone is playing the same deck, then, well, yeah, you're going to be seeing it a lot more because, well, a lot more people are playing with it, which means it has a lot more of a chance in order to, well, perform very strongly. Yeah. I do think we're seeing more of, like, the Lord Nightmon situation from BT5. So, now, that's kind of saying something else entirely, too, because I do think Lord Nightmon was the best deck of, of BT5, and all the results show that, but that's also because, basically, everyone was either playing Lord Nightmon in BT5 or playing to beat Lord Nightmon in BT5. So, it isn't really hard to argue which deck is the best, but if we had, like a theoretical indefinitely long bt5 like the the card game stop printing new cards and we only have bt5 does be, does lord nightmon stay on top forever who's to know i know um a lot of other competitive environments like uh, league of legends world series as an example world championships world series is baseball um uh they 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 play a single patch for the entire length of the tournament and the meta shifts wildly, mostly as people discover things that were good that didn't see as much of play rate, and then it, it kind of becomes uh, the whole system changes, right? If all of a sudden Jespawn sees way more play, people are going to shift their entire strategies around trying to beat Jespawn or to make sure they don't lose to Jespawn, and it really just changes what decks people are bringing what decks people are teching against, and all of those factors matter when looking at what deck is actually winning these events. Yeah, and we already kind of started talking about that discussion last time we were talking about the meta, where yellow was perceived to be the best, just because, you know, that's what Japan said, but Japan was playing with a completely different environment, and uh, we were all prepared for yellow. So what did that leave us to be? Uh, well, all of the decks that were good against yellow lost to blue. So everyone who was playing blue now had an advantage because yellow was killing itself because just of how yellow works, uh, yellow hybrids, I mean, and then, um, cause there's more to yellow than just yellow hybrids. One, le but one Lord Nightmon represent. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, yellow hybrids just kills itself in event data and then puts itself in another bracket where blue hybrids just never sees it for yellow hybrids to start feeding off of those blue hybrid players. And then uh, the blue hybrid players are now beating all of the decks that yellow hybrid was supposed to lose to 
uh, because they teched against it. And now that's like, it's kind of forming this weird little circle where it's just like, it created an environment where blue hybrids was overperforming because everyone was expecting to play against a different deck. Mm. Um, I know something uh, potentially worth mentioning here is how, like, what do you mean by like yellow killing? I guess not yellow killing itself, but like, so when we discuss like, blue like quote-unquote never seeing yellow or um it, it's because by the time you get to these end tables like we're talking you know tables one two and three in rounds like six seven and eight in a, in a you know long uh multi-round tournament what we're seeing here is that like zanitsu mentioned in an earlier round if the yellow player happens to get matched up against another yellow player, of which there are a decent amount of yellow players, at least initially, there are fewer now, um, they then, you know, they play each other, and they more than likely end in a draw. Um, and then those players now just are not represented in top tables by rounds 5, 6, and 7, which is why we, what we're saying is like, they kind of, yeah, they draw out of topping, you know? If we were to like dig deeper in these uh, data sets, potentially including like top 32, you'd probably see more of like what the average for the whole tournament was instead of what you know what was the average of the top tables. Yeah, and that's definitely very true because like part of the uh, competitive environment is matchup data. So like what you get paired against, how you get paired. And like the fact that yellow basically puts itself in its own sub bracket because it saw itself a total of one time to draw out a game is uh, very devastating for yellow as a whole. And that's kind of why a lot of people were afraid to bring security control initially, like in previous metas, was because if it sees itself, it's going to be a draw. Like there's a very low chance that somebody is going to be walking away. It's going to be a one game, 50 minute stall fest. And then it just loses it to it. It doesn't really lose itself. Um, it just loses the ability to actually win the event because of that draw. And something to note, uh, not that people need to, yeah, just something else to say here on that subject is that um, the idea that um, not only does that mirror match end up in a draw, it all but almost guarantees that they face the mirror again. Like Zenitsu said, like, putting yourself in their own sub bracket because now you're not playing like O and two or two and O you're playing, you know, two, two wins and a tie. And the only people that are tying realistically are people who either are yellow hybrid or are playing yellow hybrid playing against yellow hybrid. So you just have to get lucky in that potentially you're someone who played into a yellow hybrid and tied and it wasn't another yellow hybrid. Cause now you're probably destined for another draw. Right, and those draws uh, basically act as losses in long-form events, even though you technically didn't lose. You just don't have as much points as a win, so that is technically a loss, even though it's not realistically a loss. Yeah, looking at this data set, like, uh, not a single person in top 16 has a tie or a loss. Like, or I guess not, not no ties, but like, um, if or if they're tying, they're tying minimally. So, um... It, it is pretty much a death sentence, especially if it happens early on. Yeah, and like I said before, like because they put themselves into that sub bracket and everyone is trying to tech against it, the deck that's going to be all of the decks that teched against it is going to emerge on top, and lo and behold, it's blue hybrids. Uh, but that's because blue hybrids is actually a really strong deck, just because of its uh, not really aggro plan, because it's more of the, like a, a tempo mid range kind of a deck. Um, because it's kind of like a punishment deck that we've seen a lot of other decks kind of like not really imitate, but adopt that play strategy where it just has lots of efficiency it has lots of variance on how you could build it. And it's just a very powerful deck at stopping the opponent from doing what their game plan was while aggressing onto them and proceeding with their own game plan. That's actually like, I have, I've never uh, seen anyone say it that way before, but I, I really do agree with you. Like, I think... Because I, th I want to say in the past I had mentioned I didn't know of any Digimon deck that I would call tempo slash midrange. And Blue Hybrid is probably the best example 
thus far, because it's not really an aggro deck, because um, it isn't as fast as something like Rookie Rush or some of the other traditional like aggressive decks. It's it's not as fast as Gabu Bond, um, and yet it's not as slow as a control deck. Clearly, no one would ever argue that it's a control deck, but because it does fit somewhere in the middle, it has a good... I, and that was something I was going to say, is that, like, I think Blue Hybrid's biggest strength, especially, again, given the, you know, the small asterisk that technically this is only indicative of Blue Hybrid's being really good at events that include Psydex and Mulligans, well, not necessarily means that it wouldn't, but this is only Psydex Mulligan-based data, um, I think it's such a flexible deck, which allows it the ability to win in matches that you know, minus side deck and mulligan, they wouldn't necessarily be as favored in. Right. Like, yellow Cherubi is... Or, yellow based Cherubimon is one of those decks where it's just like, it actually, in the side, has an answer to be able to handle the Cherubi, and that's going to be in the form of Metal Gurumon, which we saw on a lot of their sideboards. Uh, I'm talking about the classic collection Metal Gurumon, because, like, you're not dumping your hand into Koji, because I learned really quickly that that's not very good. Um, <laughs> but you have just a plethora of different sub packages that you could even think about incorporating to spice it up, surprise the opponent. Uh, lots of really solid tech cards. Obviously, you're main boarding Madoki and Siako. So, like, you just have lots of other utility cards that you could be using versus other decks. And I think Mulligans and Sideboards is like a perfect example on how it takes a good deck and makes it better because of how it's built and the type of tools that it's using. It also goes to show that the inclusion of a sideboard slash mulligan um, does affect the meta, and not necessarily in the way that we had you know, originally thought. I mean, we are in a, in a fairly different place competitively than we were um, when the idea was first floated, but Jessmon didn't run away with it, you know? Everyone screaming up and down that you can't give Jessmon a mulligan. Well, you can. It won one event, but <laughs> it, it's just like not, I'm even. Yeah. yeah, like I'm trying to even think like what a Jessmon sideboard is because all of your main board cards are just super valuable. And so, like, what do you tech out? Like, there's no real room for you to tech anything out. And like, that's part of like how sideboards favor certain decks versus others. Yeah, it, it'll always be that way. Um, I think Jessmon's just somewhat hindered by the uh, red's inability to be flexible like blue can, because blue can either be aggressive or blue can be controlly, depending upon which cards you decide to put in or out. Yeah, and I think that's just a strength of blue. Like... We've seen repeatedly in the history of Digimon that like blue and yellow are basically the safest colors to pick and play just because they performed the best and have usually ended up being the boogeyman deck in each of its respective formats and it kind of flip flops. So like blue just does have lots of really good tech and tools that it has access to versus other colors. Because like red, as we went back on, like to bring back a, a small conversation from last time, uh reds hybrids or red hybrids their tamer quality sucks so that really hampers the ability for red hybrids to be good because their tamers aren't good and blue hybrids is really good because their tamer quality is actually very high same thing with yellow hybrids their tamer quality is insanely high almost to a fault mm, yeah your, your problem in yellow hybrid is which quantity of which good tamer do i want not necessarily how many like crap tamers do i have to fit in this deck yeah and like purple it doesn't necessarily have the highest quality of tamers but it doesn't have the lowest quality either and like purple as a whole just is a super synergistic combo -y color like it can just do a lot out of nowhere for like virtually nothing it's kind of insane i think purple has the advent of just having a few high quality tamers uh, you know you really only need um, a handful to, to do what you need to do. You have the, the Inheritable Tamer is good, at least for the deck, and it, it kind of in general. Um, the uh, Purple Mat 
is fantastic in that deck and again period and purple kari uh just fills in the gap and it really punishes like i know i was doing some uh solitaire games over the table recently well um and i was in a situation where i was like oh i win you know this this deck wins and i was like wait a minute there's a purple kari on the field i can't just get to zero memory and then swing it with everything and win because oh look now it passes to one memory and there goes my turn yeah and i think that's also why analog youth is like an absolutely insane card in purple too because like it just enables so many different things not only adding to the overall consistency of the deck uh acting as a good filler tamer even though they're not actually going to be digivolving on top of it they don't need to because his combo potential is insanely high for just everything that purple is doing. Purple Cherubi also, um, you mentioned like the top two competitive colors have been almost exclusively uh, blue and yellow, and Cherubi kind of just adopts the better part of the aggressive yellow package. Blinding Ray, Bushy, Salamon, pulse spawn if you need to i don't even think they need to like oh, but you got lucimon too lucimon like, yellow just yeah yellow just has an insane amount of tools that has access to as well where it can kind of just cover almost any base it needs um so i mentioned previously all of these uh deck lists so far or results are including sideboards and mulligans um and i Recently, in a late night fever dream, um, I'm kind of theorizing slash predicting that we may see some official announcement fairly soon on like the results of this. I know um, Bandai has reached out through a couple of content creators and just said, "Hey, we want some like concrete feedback on this." I imagine I wasn't in attendance either of these events, but they had some personnel on hand. Like they genuinely want to know. Was this a positive change for the card game? Do we think it's the right direction? We all know it was a test bed, but the results may come sooner than we thought because in the announcement to the next set of online events, the Ultimate Cup, it included a single line, and I latched onto it. <laughs> so all of the lines, all of the, the rule sets for every tournament had been, you know, this deck, this event will take place, 50 minute rounds, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the, the, the Ultimate Cup had a single line of text at the bottom that just said, modified rules to be announced. And I think that means the like formal announcement of either Sideborn and Mulligan, or just Mulligan, or neither. Yeah, uh, I saw that too. And um, I don't know why I wasn't put into that conversation. I mean, I do and I don't, but... Um... Because I'm not on Bandai's good boy list, apparently. But regardless of, of uh, saltiness aside, um, it definitely still is something that needs to be talked about because it does fundamentally change our format. And like we almost, if that is a thing that just gets permanently installed into our version of the game, we almost need to start thinking differently than Japan. And we almost need different rule sets because of it. So, like, something that's limited or banned for Japan um, might be exacerbated for us uh, just because of how sideboards and mulligans could work. So, like, we need some more faster reactions, and we need, um, and we need a, a difference in the cards that are being picked to get hit or limited. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting point. Um... I guess, where would you go with that, though? Like, not that necessarily that I don't have any cards that I would want, like, hit right now, but do you really think there are any cards that are that dire that need to get removed? Um, As of this moment, no, because I don't have a whole lot of experience with BT8 and above meta right now, just because I've been so focused on BT7 meta. Uh, but I can definitely see in the future where it's just like, oh, we need this card to be hit because this card becomes more problematic because of sideboarding and just multicolor Digimon and various other factors that could just make a, a perfect storm of um, shenanigans that 
sh this card should be dealt with. I know we're getting, I think, two new, like, uh, Floodgate cards in BT8 in the form of Psychomon Purple Rookie. All turns, players cannot reduce play costs. Um, which should be fairly meta-defining, and the black rookie, Kokuwagamon, or Kok Kokuwaman, that's actually a weird name, um, all turns, players cannot ignore Digivolution requirements. Um, I'm struggling here to think of a specific example for that card, but in a world where sideboards exist, some of these rookies kind of turn off entire strategies. Psychomon specifically in the form of like um, Three Musketeers as an example. There's already a card that hates Three Musketeers. Like adding another one that just means that they can't play their deck. I don't know if that's necessarily a great idea. But I also don't know if with the, the speed and the efficiency at which decks are at the moment... If any deck really wants to, and just slap in an off-colored rookie for those matchups. I mean, decks like Purple Cherubimon definitely can, just because of how Cherubimon works. So, like, because Cherubimon can bring back any Digimon of any color within his level parameter, like, that makes it very easy to just throw it in the trash, because, you know, you have lots of mill and you have lots of draw and discard and then you just bring it out when you need to like we saw that in one of the top decks um in worlds i believe yeah in worlds uh they literally ran gazimon even though they were running um yellow, yellow eggs. eggs just because they could res it off mm -hmm. of cherubimon and then now they have both cutemon and gazimon so now they're basically like blue mm. um i guess the the fairly like default response to that would be who is playing purple cherubian vt8 but that's i guess potentially another discussion yeah i would say per like not to delve too deep into it i actually think purple cherubian is pretty spicy in bt8 i'm just looking through bt8 it doesn't look like they get... you get the yellow cherubian that could pop the purple cherubian and it only costs three to do that while having a Mega on the field, while also getting Cherubimon's ability. I guess. While also stall stalling the opponent out because of the new Cherubimon's ability. And when you play know. this card, you can reduce its play cost. Not with... What's his face on the board? <laughs> yeah, but you did evolve into Cherubimon to wipe it off the face of the planet, and yeah. then you can combo off. Um, so, like, that's just kind of, like, the benefit of Cherubimon, where it's, like, he already, in BT7, has a really solid punish game. Like, the, his punish game is even more on point than Blue's because of just purple being purple, I guess, is the best way I could explain it. Like, you already are just doing a lot proactively and reactively. Yeah. Um. So... I guess going to the the start of where I was going with this discussion is um so if I guess we now have co concrete data that like I had mentioned prior by the the other digifest that we know now the answer to the uh question what wins when yellow hybrid is the presumed best deck and that's blue hybrid and I, I would say we have enough data now to potentially say even what wins if blue hybrid is potentially the best deck. And it's still kind of blue, but it's not necessarily only blue, but it's still decently blue. Yeah, I mean, it goes into the self-fulfilling prophecy where it's just like if you if you're playing lots of if blue is being overrepresented, then it's going to have a higher chance of winning because there's a lot more blue out there to win mm -hmm. yeah and it does have the flexibility um it it loses some of that flexibility without a sideboard um i i really because i and the, i guess one feedback that i definitely have heard kind of across the board is that 
everyone thinks the mulligan is kind of a gimme. Nobody's really arguing against a mulligan anymore. It's it's almost exclusively the sideboard that all the attentions move to. The the mulligan's almost guaranteed by like the the player's opinions point of view. Obviously, it's up to Van Dyke's decision if they want to change the point of the game, but it's so easy and minimally impactful to implement for them just to say, "Oh yeah, you could just top the top toss the top 5 cards to the bottom of your deck if you want." You know, like it it's just makes the game so much better. Yeah, and after playing with uh, mulligans, it's it's really just not even, like, it, it does help reduce the amount of non-games, and I think that's, like, the biggest goal for having the mulligan, is just taking those games that would normally just be an auto-loss because you have, like, what, a handful of level 5s and 6s and can't do anything, and significantly reduces that while also adding its own level of depth and skill. Um, sideboards, on the other hand, after playing with sideboards, uh, I'm a little bit more iffy on it. Like, I don't think it's a bad thing, but it definitely is something that isn't equal across the field based on, and this is more just based on like the cards that other colors have and the tools that they're playing with just aren't all on equal playing fields. Yeah. Um, unfortunately we won't necessarily like, if ever, like know the results of like, we don't know how far ahead they, in advance they design cards, and we don't know how far in advance they, if if they would ever care about us specifically, us being the only ones using sideboards and mulligans, I guess, as the English world. Because um, they don't design cards for us. We, we kind of already know that a little bit. Um, but maybe that changes, um, depending on the popularity. But we, we can't really say for sure. The one thing that I would say is that while I think mulligan or sideboards are a good addition right now, and I think there's no reason not to implement them right now, and there's um, even with like the small discrepancies you mentioned, my small reservation is that once implemented becomes a staple and a like permanent inclusion, and we don't know what cards haven't been printed yet and won't have been printed with sideboards in mind because they do design and create cards in advance and even if they do design and create cards in advance we don't know if bt10 is going to include some really dumb super floodgate or something like we've already seen um i believe it's ex2 there being um geez i gotta find it uh, the purple tamer that like they really gotta watch their wordings on things like like we've seen with Cherubi and the Alice McCoy the EX2 tamer that states when your level five Digimon would digivolve, boom. Even though it's a purple tamer, it only costs two and it doesn't specify a color. Every deck can run that card and every deck could potentially sideboard that card. Um, so. I just I don't want to necessarily end up in a world where um, the sideboards do get degenerate. I don't think they are right now, but they definitely could be. Yeah, and that's kind of just like the the tug of war of like game design. Um, most of the time, from my own past experience, uh, just with Magic and various other card games, and working on a card game myself, um, usually you will be planning two to three sets ahead. And based on Digimon's set design, they kind of just make cards and then just shove them into whatever set they feel like is appropriate. Um, but they're probably at least working three to four sets ahead just because of uh, the pairings that each set has, where it'll have the foundation or core in one set. Then the next set will have the rest of that foundation or core to flesh it out, keep it alive, or just a couple of cards for updates. So, like, they're probably at least uh, two to four sets ahead. And, yeah, the more cards that get added to the pool, obviously the, the higher chance that they have for error when designing for something that's completely using... that's completely being used for something unintentional. Yeah. I mean, so... Just using that as an, as a, an example. So, right now, Japan is playing with... BT9. BT9 is, is the most legal up-to-date card. That is one, two, three, 
four. So oh, they have eight EX2. So it's th there's three sets ahead of us and approaching, not exactly, two sets of starter decks on which, you know, change the, the format a non-negligible amount, as we saw with um, the last two. Obviously, the Jogris support will help again. We don't know exactly what's even in the the next two starter decks after that, but three sets ahead, if they operate and design potentially three sets further ahead, now we're talking six sets between them announcing the inclusion of, like, sideboards, like, game-wide in English, and then them actually even beginning to think about, oh crap, what are they going to side in in BT, you know, 11? I imagine there's, so I think it's going to go like BT10, EX3, then BT11, potentially. That's that's why I use that number. I guess if they don't include an EX3, it'd be like BT12. But that's pretty far into the future for us to now be playing in BT7 so far removed from that. And they're like, hey, cyborgs are a thing. And someone's already designed a just stupid card for BT11 that is going to ruin the game, and we have no idea. Yeah, Alice McCoy is kind of, I don't want to say hitting that territory, but like she definitely has that potential where like there's just a lot of unforeseen interactions that the designers didn't necessarily predict or plan on players adapting. And that's like part of the crux on like why certain cards get hit and certain cards gets limited is because of those unforeseen interactions that like the designers just completely overlooked. And they're not doing it on purpose, believe me. Uh, I've been there. They are just doing their own thing, and you can only do so much when you're working with a lot, especially uh, being so far ahead compared to what's actually being played. Yeah, you'd really have to trust your internal testing at that point to not screw something up before it even comes out. But we're... I guess we're really, we're really reaching here, but... Um, and it, it, it deserves to get talked about. I'm not, I don't regret it. Um, but my, my major point being that, um, to tie up my ramble is that I, I think as it stands right now, I want sideboards. I think sideboards are a good addition. They add, you know, each time you choose to side something in, each time you choose to add a card to your sideboard, it's a competitive decision. And, even if you are someone who's, they're like, oh, I'm just going to net deck a sideboard, like I net deck a deck, then go ahead. You won't be as good as someone who understands theirs. You won't be as good as someone who's changed theirs slightly, you know, to adapt to whatever meta that they see fit. Um, and, uh, but I also understand that if they add, they add sideboards in as at this moment, and then in BT, whatever, some card comes out that just breaks the game, they're going to look back and say, I told you so, but we don't know that right now. And it, you know, that's not well, the, a terrible decision. Yeah, well, the problem is that, like, they're not even paying it. To, like, they are paying attention to us, but they're not really paying attention to us because, like, they're already, they're so focused in, I don't want to say the Japanese bubble, but they're trying to take care of their card game natively first, and then everything else is just an afterthought. Um, it's not exactly true, but it's kind of in that same vein. But getting to the point, I don't even think that they are aware on like the grand ramifications of what a sideboard can do to physically and fundamentally change a game in a competitive environment. So like that's kind of why I'm like, cautiously optimistic on a sideboard i think there is a lot of skill and a lot of depth in there but like i said before not everything is created equal they really have to be careful on designing certain cards and i don't think based on the environment that they're supposed to be designed and made for they're really thinking about that especially when it's just like an off-the-cuff change where it's just like we had an off-the-cuff change with uh just how triggers work as a whole and like that fundamentally changed a good portion of cards and how we can play them and sideboards can have a very similar approach um for a competitive environment mm. so like i'm almost thinking what would these events look like 
if we didn't have sideboards and what would the results be if we didn't have sideboards and how would blue like is blue actually dominating because of the sideboard or is it dominating because it's just that good and the sideboard is only making it better we don't know but i guess my original point when i mentioned it at all was kind of like we may see if i'm wrong if I'm wrong and this announcement is not going to be just the widespread adoption of sideborns and mulligans, or, the, the, like, I guess, potentially more likely, I guess, if I want to be a safer betting person, the widespread adoption of, at, at a minimum, mulligans, um, then we may see that as of the April uh, Ultimate Cup. Well, the funny thing is, is, like, the way that they worded it, they could have tournaments with it and without it like it doesn't necessarily have yeah. to be just hardcore adopt infused into the game now it is written in the rules for their therefore it is like they could just say hey this is the format with sideboards and mulligans here's an event without it the only now let's see i don't have it pulled up i feel like i should the only thing that i would say is is there any sort of like nationals mention at all in these events you don't win no. you don't qualify for anything by winning right nope so absolutely nothing. they could just 100 like percent. so they could 100 percent include cyborgs and mulligans and it not affect the technical most competitive sphere it could be well, it's technically like a side format at that point you know very closely adjacent but decidedly removed um in some ways yeah, they they definitely have room to play around and experiment. So, um, if so, if big if blue is the new big bad, um, the like I, blue's still good, I guess, is the kind of answer we've touched on a couple times, because now going into these last couple tournaments for these different events, blue was the deck everyone was teching against they were siding against specifically not just teching siding they were um you know potentially mulliganing against i don't know how you mulligan against certain like we don't this isn't magic but you mostly just mulligan for a usable hand if if ever um because I, I, I guess that's another thing i know about mulligans is that like not only is it so minimally impactful as far as like the, the space of the game is concerned, I find myself very rarely, if ever, mulliganing. Maybe that's wrong of me, but I, I very well, rarely I, wanted to throw cards to the bottom of my deck. I was in a very similar boat. Like I think out of 10 games that I played at Locals, I only mulliganed like once. And I think that's like partially due to the consistency of decks going up and the usability of cards also going up. Like, we have multiple ways of using one card versus one way of using one card. I think we talked about that before for uh, a hot minute, but, like, just to recap that is, like, oh, this level 4 Digimon, I could Digivolve off of a Tamer. I could Digivolve off of another level 4. Or I could Digivolve off of a level 3. That's three different ways to use one card, so it just has increased levels of play. And also that's kind of it. just... It's not ideal, yeah. but you could, so... There's another I mean, one. Yeah, so <laughs> technically four ways to play it, but like regardless, the usability of cards is going up, and that also reduces the amount of times you would want to mulligan because you have a usable card in your hand. Yeah, I know. Like, it is it is kind of weird how how quickly things change because I know when I played Lord Knight on BT five, the uh, I I called my deck like anti brick Lord Nightmon because I changed my level 4s and level 5s around, uh, because in yellow and heritables aren't really a thing, um, modified specifically to make my worst hand not as bad as it could be, because I found in that format especially, in the mirror, if my first turn is to hard play a 6 cost level 4, I've lost the game. So I try to avoid that as much as possible, and I tweaked my on-play costs. And, you know, when that was my biggest concern back then, like, it's just funny to think about now. Yeah, the, the game definitely has 
grown up a lot and it only added to the overall complexity but like in in a more fun and exciting way just because like you just have more possibilities because of all of the different cards like before digimon was so limited just because of the cards that you were working with and now they're slowly expanding it to where like now they're actually expanding on the expansions so we just have more tech and tools to be playing with mm. and part of the reason like maybe why blue hybrids is doing so well or hybrid decks as a whole is doing so well is also the fact that we don't have a whole lot of answers to counterplay against it which as we can see in future sets there are those counterplays because while they weren't necessarily planning on them being hard counters, they just happen to be hard counters because of how the mechanic works. Um, not yeah. saying that it's actually just a hard counter, period. It's just like, oh, Jogress. Well, now the Digimon can attack after you Jogress. That's something that takes away stun locking, and now you have a usable Digimon that can attack for you literally just having a Digimon on the field. Mm -hmm. Like... Yeah, that's, you know, really, it, it's really gimps push lose ball. ability to to do that. It just kind of removes yeah, that it, as a mechanic. Yeah, it's just the push and pull of like how things are designed and the mechanics that they're trying to introduce and play around with. Um So I guess it really it leads to the greater discussion of like what what is a victory as far as like if you are you know the advocate for whichever deck you're playing or like at what point is blue hybrid able to claim victory over this format they have two they're the highest performing number like like play rate wise by far now at top tables and they've won two of the five events that we care to write down who won <laughs> um so i like at what point do you say you win? Because as we've like we've mentioned a couple times, you know, it they're not necessarily like the best deck because they don't always win. Green hybrid won, Jessmon won, Yellow hybrid won. So there are competition. There is competition for the best deck at a given event. But if you're making up 65% of that top 16 anyway. Who cares if you win to some extent, I guess? I, I see where you're going with this. And like, I don't just like Lord Nightmon. I don't necessarily think there is a you win button. It's just like what has the overall representation by the end of the meta is kind of just the winner by default, because like now we're just moving on. So I think that's the winning point is like the end of it when none of it kind of matters anymore it's just like looking at the grand scheme of things it's like oh yeah blue hybrids was just the best um yeah. that's the point when it wins right now we still have a whole month to go and we still have events that are being planned and prepared along with like casual stuff that's also going on as well like it's definitely still i don't want to say like super early but like we're definitely at a point where we're going to start to try to figure out what counters blue more than what counters yellow. I mean, not to <laughs> like, I don't disagree with you that like, we're not early, but we're also like, we're looking down the barrel of BT eight here. You know, I mean, in almost exactly a month's time, we're going to be playing with BT eight. At least I will, you know, I'll be at my BT eight pre-release. So BT seven will be behind us. It's fairly yeah. short format in general. Like, I, I, I mean, maybe, like... It was about two months. Maybe the, the um... I mean, given the length of last format. Um, but, um... The idea that, like, BT7... We, we just might not have time for there to be this level of intricate, you know, gradual adaptation where... I mean, it's probably a, a, a small amount of a people figuring out what would beat blue hybrid and then b people getting bored of playing either with or against blue hybrid and just playing something else and i think that's kind of like why i'm enjoying these slightly shorter formats where it's just like it's two months just because like a whole nother month of like being like oh i gotta play blue hybrids again 
led to like a huge decline in the player base with um bt5 being such a long format with just lord nightmon being supposedly the dominating deck because it was uh and like these smaller formats um definitely lead to not necessarily that boredom but like not that winning point either where you could just say definitively this was boom the best deck yeah and without there being any sort of like prize to claim from this format like so while technically worlds is something i know we, we mentioned it like like in passing almost like worlds kind of didn't matter like congratulations like the people that are already in the top eight they got to have their own little tournament little, little like locals with a slightly larger spotlight and now we have a world champion for the english format um but as anyone who's like won a locals knows that like not necessarily the best player wins a locals because it's just smaller sample size unfortunately yeah and um the uh the sample size while it did have a very healthy spread of decks um blue still i believe blue still ended up winning worlds but mm -hmm. again that was just First because and like second place it, it, yeah that's that's because again smaller sample size uh also like they were split up into different pools so there was like pool a and pool b so like obviously one person dominated uh pool a With and blue. one person dominated <laughs> pool b to help form that top four and top two and top one and blue is still a good represented deck there um i guess my my, my point for mentioning worlds at all being that like what what is there to win from bt7 what does being the best deck in bt7 get you and the answer is currently if you're one of the eight people that qualify for worlds worlds and if you're not nothing because unlike lord nightmon unlike even potentially i guess like yellow war Greymon, there's no real tangible benefit like besides notoriety and like cool prize cards of like okay you know the april eve or ultimate cup is coming out i guess i have to play blue hybrid because it's the best deck like you know i mean i guess if you want to be competitive at every event sure but ultimately the idea that you have to play a blue hybrid i i don't agree with i guess i also don't agree with it i usually try to strive like personally for diversity like every week at locals i bring a completely different deck and like just try to have fun because that's what the game's about if i bring blue hybrids every single time people are going to quit and leave i've already had that happen once before and i don't want that to happen again uh not just because i was winning locals a lot um but because i was just playing the one good deck a lot and people were just getting really sick tired and bored with it and eventually they just stop showing up i don't believe i've mentioned it on the podcast at least i know i've mentioned it to like teammates but um i actually have a funny story i guess about that like uh i didn't play like the the latter like mid to latter half of uh bt5 only because i got really like wrapped up with finishing school and kind of bored of it even though i was playing lord nightmon and so for pre-releases my local stores don't do a like a sealed event because they've had major problems with sealed, sealed events and other card games in the past and they just kind of avoid that entirely by like hey you know you're playing for prizing let's not make it random just bring a deck from the prior format we'll have a regular tournament and award prizes that way the problem with that being so for the bt6 pre-release it was a bt5 tournament much to everyone's chagrin um and I hadn't played in a while, especially had definitely hadn't been to locals in a little while, and so I brought my beat my my Lord Nightmon to my pre-release with the intention of like just being competitive, and I felt like I I like broke some sort of unspoken rule. I was the only one playing Lord Nightmon there, probably because everyone else had gotten sick and fucking tired of playing against it. <laughs> yeah, this was um, BT. I believe it was BT four. 
Um, a lot of people were really sick and tired of me playing Yellow War Greymon. Mm. Um, and yeah, that, that kind of led into the downfall of uh, a lot of the players at my locals just stopped showing up. Uh, we're doing okay. I would like to, us to do better with more people, but uh, that's that's just a that's a very complicated thing in of itself but regardless like people will eventually just get bored um and i think that's kind of like the benefit of like these slightly shorter formats where it's like two months because usually it takes about a month for a meta to actually develop and then a month for like the fluctuations in that meta to happen and then that third month usually is when people start getting bored because like the fluctuations slow down things get more solved, and that's when the boredom starts to kick in. I know personally, it's it's harder because we have had so many, um, like, defined metas, I guess. Not, not necessarily solved, but, like, it, it does hurt our, um, I guess, potentially fun of the game that we walk into a format and we... Like, regardless of our own competitive ability to read the cards and put decks together in our in our minds, um, we we have literal deck lists from literal tournament winning, you know, locals, I guess, as far as Japan's concerned. But, um, and they've played with them for months. So even if it is only local level events, they, there's a fairly large aggregate out there, if, especially if you go through, like, you know, Twitter hashtags. But, um... And so then we walk into our first, you know, on Evo Cup or something like that, and it's just, you know, 60% Lord Nightmon. Like, you wouldn't necessarily see that if that wasn't the case, I guess. And and especially coming from other card games and looking at other card games, like even like their metas now that I don't even follow or participate in anymore, they're not nearly this warping. Perception is a very, very powerful tool, and the fact that, yeah, we do have um, something to pull from definitely makes picking up the pieces where they last left off um, kind of interesting, in in a sense, because, like, on one hand, it does take the experimentation of figuring out all this stuff out, like, it just completely eliminates that for the most part. I know there are some people who will just do it anyway, and they'll be like, I'm going in this blind. And then they'll get their, like, booty clapped, and then they'll be like, oh, that was so bad of me, and now I need to go back to the drawing board. And, like, they'll actually, like, start to play around with the format the way it should be. But, like, there's a certain point where it's just, like, you kind of don't have to do that because we have some information to pull from. And, like, looking at uh, the furthest point to see, like, what is still competitively viable... Um, and just basically tuning it down to the current format, at least that's like the approach that I generally take, kind of opens your eyes on like the difference in the play styles between each of the formats. Okay, so uh, thought experiment right here. I, I want you to workshop through me because uh, this is a very reasonable question for someone like you to get. Uh, I want to play D Reaper in BT8. Build me a deck. Well, I mean, obviously you can't do that because D-Reaper doesn't exist. But, like, I'm just saying, like, if you want to play, let's just say, uh, War Greymon, like, you could build a War Greymon core, a War Greymon shell, make it as competitively viable for the environment that you're currently in, and then transition it to what it's supposed to be in the next set. Like, Jessmon's a good example of this, where it's like, the core doesn't really change, it's just some tech and tools that do based on the environment. So it's just like, okay, save your hooks getting limited. What do I do? I have no idea what to do now that my best card is gone. So like usually I would look to see, okay, what are the best substitutes that people are using in Japan? And then kind of see the reasons why and what they're playing with to make those cards excel even more. Hmm. Yeah. That was a joke by the way, but uh, um I mean yeah. Like I got the... that because certain <laughs> decks just don't exist. Yeah. Period. I want to play Armor V Mon in BT six. Um, yeah, like it is. It is pretty hard to to look at some of the stuff that like completely changes the way you play the game. But um, 
Yeah, you can definitely make shells and pieces of decks, and it won't necessarily do the same thing or feel the same, but, um, I mean, that's literally what happened with security control, right? Like, security control didn't really exist until BT6 in Japan, which was, like, BT3 for us, or 1.5, so then by the time 4 came out and we started to get some of the pieces that were used in that deck to actually make the deck, people just started making it immediately with only half the deck. Yeah, and that's kind of like the example of like picking off uh like the furthest point of information to see like what they're doing, why they're doing it, what tools they're using, how can I incorporate this now? And like we could see that in the future like blue hybrids isn't necessarily that much of a problem because there's like I said before, mechanics in place to limit some of those shenanigans that normally are making blue hybrids really strong. I know it's like almost entirely unrelated, but I just, um, I really hate Japanese ratios. Like they don't make sense to me. And I, I hate that I like sometimes use them. Like I had saved like, um, when BT eight had come out, um, a black war Greymon list. And I just like literally like wrote the deck, broke the deck list down, like from like a Twitter image, like this one of locals. And I looked at it recently and I was like, why are they running 16 rookies in Black War Greymon? Get out of here. Like, eh. Or, like, and then they're only, like, basically, it was like a Jessmon list, I guess. Which makes sense, because coming off the heels of Jessmon being their best deck, kind of. Not, I mean, not, not maybe at that point, but Yellow Hybrids, I think, had picked up enough steam. But Red Hybrid, or Jessmon still being good enough to warrant, you know, restriction, um... Uh, like, I guess just due to playability, too. It wasn't even necessarily that good. It was just that, like, it was the only red deck anyone was playing, because why not? But the, um, they were just building Black War Greymon as if it were Jessmon. They were running, like, a, a massively wide bottom end with, like, four copies of Metal Greymon as their only level fives, and then just Black War Greymon as the only level six. Except for, I think they included one copy of The Secret from BT1, because if you use those two, uh, uh, that on top of a BT8 Metal Greymon, uh, I think it lets you swing and attack unsuspended Digimon indefinitely, right? It's like a board clear, pretty sure if I'm remembering yeah, the combination he, correctly. Yeah, he'll just keep going until there's nothing left, Yeah, basically. his, because his text reads, not once per turn, if you, um... Uh, what what is it? The Wait, I gotta read these cards. Jeez, sorry. Um, yeah, this can attack your so Metal Greymon Inheritable is while this Digimon has Dragonkin or Machine, it can attack your opponent's unsuspended Digimon, and the secret Black War Greymon from BT One, I think. I don't one point zero. It was one point yeah, for 1. us. Yeah, one point zero. Um, states not once per turn. Um. I guess it's not a once per turn, but like, um, uh, yeah, not once per turn. If you attack your opponent's highest DP Digimon, you can unsuspend yourself. So being able to un attack unsuspended Digimon and re unsuspending every time would just give you an infinite, a board wipe as long as you went from the highest to the lowest DP wise. Yeah. And those types of interactions are always, like, really, really interesting on trying to figure out. Uh, but, like, because uh, Japan did it first, we didn't really have to do a lot of that work. And, mm -hmm. uh, oddly enough, that combo was rarely used in Japan. Yeah, like, it was basically seen as a one-of sometimes. But I guess that's, but that's, like, a Jessmon-style list anyway where sometimes they run an alternative lovers level six, but not even necessarily always. I guess in North America, we prefer a higher level of consistency, but that was really my, my general statement slash hot take. I hate Japanese ratios because they, they fucking build weird decks for best of ones, man. I mean, yeah, they they have to because <laughs> best of ones, you have to be a lot more greedy and play a lot more high roll, so that way uh, your wins feel more like wins. So... Um, yeah, I really don't know what else to say. I know, like, we kind of touched on, so if blue isn't necessarily the best deck, 
who kind of cares because it's really up to you to decide whether you want to bring blue or if you want to try and beat blue. I guess at this point, it's almost a given that you will play against a lot of blue. So playing something that you think is at least not hard countered by blue is a pretty good idea. Definitely don't go playing um, like Machine German or even like I know Black Hex anybody has done decently well, like in token examples, but like decks that like care about their inheritals, I would probably avoid. Yeah, and like the big thing about the blue versus blue mirror, because I do have some experience in that, is it all it literally all comes down to who sees their tamers in a better order or at all. So like there is a huge uh, advantage for you having a tamer to give you memory set up ASAP versus not like it is almost night and day on how you could accelerate your game plan and once your game plan is accelerated over the opponent that's how you get the advantage so like if you notice the opponent doesn't have their memory fixing tamer out you could really take advantage of that and really punish blue even though they do have some instant memory gain um you have a way to shut that off yeah you just get the double floodgate punish them for it yeah like because i played um blue hybrids against various other decks and like that's kind of just how i win is uh they don't have their memory fixing tamer set up and i do and i just gain so much advantage and shut off their plays that they just they literally can't do anything and that's how blue wins um i don't play blue but i do know that playing against blue one of the biggest things i've seen is in like differences in the blue matchup um number one uh, from very early on testing, uh, don't play, you know, the, the maximum, like, Koji package. It's not that great. Like, I know, I think at this point, the, just the inclusion of um, the level 6, Jesus, what's his name? Um, Magna. Magna. The Magna inclusion Garurum. of Magna Garurumon, like, is somewhat, it depending on who, which decks you look at, like, defines the... Um, uh, archetype, I guess. Some some of them call like blue hybrid, like without Magna, and some of them are like calling it like Magna Guru hybrid with it. Like that's why we we consolidate all that crap because it's really out of basis blue hybrid. Um, but don't that 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 package is bad. Don't lean into it as much if at all. Like one or two of at most, maybe. Um, here's here's the secret spice with blue hybrids that probably nobody's even thought of um you could theoretically try running thomas what the red tamer no thomas is a blue tamer three drop draw a card on play why and if you run mirage galgamon you could use him to uh multi-attack and be a really cheap evo into a level five like or a level six. It's it's really really far fetched, but I kind of want to oh, test BT4 it to see how rare. that would work. Uh, he's a super rare in BT four. Uh, but Thomas is a rare. That's what uh, I mean, so yeah. Thomas will allow you to like unsuspend your Magna when you make your Magna play, or at worst, hard play, draw a card, draw Bumon. There you go. Yeah. Uh, on a tamer. Yeah, I mean, Thomas is a like like almost direct replacement for the on play gabumon that blue used to play but now it's a tamer so it's better in blue hybrids but no one's yeah but this is like other one anyway yeah and that's like the type of experimentation that i think looking at japanese data kind of robs us where it's just like no one wants to experiment with that because they don't know if it's going to be good or not and like that's going to take testing and that's going to take time and people don't have either of those things. So they'd rather just net deck and look at Japanese results and just be like, okay, this is just the tried and true boom, done easy. Um, and that's not exactly always the case, especially if you want to be competitive. Mm. So, um, but I guess what I, to finish what I was saying, the idea that the difference in how the blue player plays, um, does make a huge difference i know like the best the best turns for blue hybrid are the turns where they don't have to commit to they never have to hard commit to their plays and they can slowly 
safely work their way through it. Like the easiest one as an example is um, if I'm playing black and I have, you know, potentially board wipes and security, they can just evo one, one height, one level four at a time, you know, evo over a tamer, swing, check security, okay, evo over a tamer, swing, check security. You don't have to commit to it all at once and then have your board get blown up. And that's like a really positive strength of the deck. That and like because your memory fixing tamer on top of your um, duo tamer is just one of the better pairs in the game, uh, you can have access to a lot of memory to be able to just poke a couple of times and then just literally sit on a field of tamers and just literally slowly go up, poke again, go up, poke again, go up, poke again. And that's kind of just how blue hybrids wins. So, like, to counter that, like, you just need to understand what they're trying to do and what their current board state is and evaluate what type of cards you should be playing to either A, prevent that, or B, take advantage of that. Now, see, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at cards. I actually, I want to disagree with you a little bit because I don't think, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think a Zulongmon slash Hexablauan, but mostly a Zulongmon, has been like a North American English uh, adaptation to the deck. I really don't think they were running that as their top end ever. They were basically exclusively running Magna or nothing. Uh, in Japan, they were running a Zulong. Were they? Damn, never mind. Yeah, there were there were a decent number of people who were running a Zulong because it's just like, look, you have a field of stunned Stingimon. Cool, easy as Zulong play, swing, punch for a lot of security because they have, like, a couple of Digimon without inheritables. But, like, and the fact that he's 13 means that he has an even higher chance on base of surviving. Uh, the only things that would really take him down is an Ancient or a level 7. And there's not a whole lot of level 7s, and very few decks are playing Ancients. So, yeah. It's, Wyvern's uh, Breath, too, but... That's it. I mean, yeah, there's there's also options, but like in blue, are you really afraid of options in security when you could just like poke them? Mm -hmm. Like taper your attacks, poke them. You would obviously lead with um the big punch first and then taper the the little ones in after the big punch is gone. Cuz that way you could evaluate what their security is and how much I need to commit. Well, um I guess that's all I have for this week um do you have anything else you want to say Zenitsu? uh the big takeaway is like blue is performing relatively well but that's because um the supposed boogeyman deck was actually a false boogeyman deck and everyone was trying to play to beat the the perceived best deck and now that best deck has changed so it kind of leads us to this environment that we're currently facing ourselves in, and it, it is not 110% definitively the best deck, at least not yet. And even if it is, so what? It's going to be a little bit annoying for a total of a month, and then it goes away. Not really goes away, but like there's actual answers and ways to deal with it. So like, it's not going to be the end of the world if we have one format where blue hybrids just steamrolls everything, which it theoretically shouldn't because other decks can perform it's just an unfortunate consequence of just how the ban list happened how player perception is received and like the lack of experimentation people are actually doing yeah i i guess i think the best part about it would be that like it it doesn't necessarily go away because it gets that much worse um it does get a little bit worse be, like via the mechanics you mentioned but I think the biggest thing is that it's not the newest at deck anymore. A lot of people are going to stop playing it, and that should make it less annoying, period. Yeah, so it's just a waiting game on um, seeing what happens, seeing where the meta develops, if it's going to change at all, and just getting ready for BT8 when that rolls around in May. Okay, with that, I think I'm going to close it out. Uh, goodbye. Later.